welcome to the Motorhome Map podcast with me, Keith Gooden. I ask the stupid questions and... Motorhome Map tries to answer them. <laughs> and he does successfully. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Brought to you with thatleisureshop.com. First of all, let's talk about the shop. Uh, Matt, what do you recommend for our season ahead? Well, it's definitely worth making sure you've got all the chemicals you need and the gas you need for the summer season. Uh, make sure you've got the toilet chemical you need, whatever you're using. Uh, you can get that at thatleisureshop.com. Uh, and uh, all of that cleaning stuff as well. Outside, inside, specialist chemical, we've got it all. Let's delve into the news then, uh, shall we? Let's talk about a very interesting news story which appeared in the press about the weight of electric vehicles and how it could compromise multi-storey car parks. They're all going to collapse and we're all going to die, apparently, under the weight of the cars because they're all going electric. That's not quite what Chris Wopples, who is a car park and structural consultant, told the newspapers. He said way back when the Cortina uh, would weigh uh, 1,300 kilograms and now a Tesla EV is twice that weight. So he is saying that actually if you've got a full car park with electric cars, maybe the structure of some of our older multi-storeys could be called into question maybe i mean the the weight of the car park is significant on its own without any cars in it so that's its first challenge isn't it keeping itself upright Uh, i mean it's a factor um it was countered though wasn't it with a number of things online a number of stories online where people were saying well sure a big ev is heavier than a ford cortina but actually all cars are heavier than they used to be Uh, we've got 1934 austin 7 and it it weighs hardly anything. It's a tiny little car. New cars are much bigger, but they are getting smaller and smaller, particularly for those cities where parking is restricted. So all cars are getting heavier. But yeah, I think if you compare a Ford Cortina, which is actually a very small car. I mean, there, there's people listening that don't know what that is. <laughs> there's people in this room that don't know what that is. Uh, but it was a very small but very standard family car. The equivalent now is probably a Fiesta, But that's heavier than a Ford Cortina, yet it's probably smaller. Well, Chris Wapples has flagged it up. Uh, Let's hope people pay attention. I know very close to us here, uh, one of the multi-stories in Bath was demolished uh, because it was just old and things like concrete cancer and all the rest of it take its toll. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But councils don't want cars in the cities anyway, so they're surely going to start pulling them down anyway. So out-to-city car parks are going to be the way forward, aren't they? Big park and rides, um, new developments for car parking. Uh, But I don't think we're going to see new inner-city car parks being built. Let's talk about the main part of this uh, podcast, shall we? First time buyer pitfalls. We have covered this a a little in the past, Matt. So what have you got to add to it then? Well, we wanted to focus on some of the buying scams that go on because they are a reality. Uh, It happened to us this week. Um, We have a a separate uh, business called Burrington Horse Boxes and we sell vans that are converted to little horse boxes at three and a half ton um, usually. And uh, somebody emailed us late in the evening and said can you confirm that this these are your details and they were buying a horse trailer on ebay Uh, i think it was no it's facebook marketplace and uh the seller sent them an invoice with our name on said burrington horse boxes and a random name and a random bank account nothing to do with us at all and they basically duped us and they were trying to con this buyer out of nearly three thousand pounds and thankfully for the buyer, they saw they they saw the light and, and exercised some diligence and emailed us and said, "Can you confirm these are your bank details?" And they're absolutely not. We're not selling this. And I have to say, the advert looked really genuine. It, I could see nothing wrong with the advert at all. I then reported the advert, and so did they. Uh, but it's so easy to be scammed. And <clears throat> Jude said to me, my other half, she said, you know, why would you buy a horse box or anything like that and not go and see it? Well, we've actually just bought a trailer, a big tower van type trailer, you know, a big box on wheels for going to all these shows with the shop. I didn't go and see it. I sent the man, OK, £200 uh, to secure it. And then we went into London to go and view it and paid him the rest. But, you know, I said, well, we've just done exactly that. Oh, OK, only with £200. But... You know, we had a phone call as well to try and make sure each other were genuine. But it's so easy to be scammed online. So we wanted to kind of highlight 
when it comes to motorhomes, this has been very commonplace and very prolific where people are, are scamming people and the pitfalls of buying a motorhome online. Not choosing the right one for you. We've covered that in the past at length. And you can go and listen to those episodes. I think it's called Choosing the Right Motorhome for You. Uh, and we've covered buying from a dealer or buying private and which one is best or better. So this is more about the scams online. Uh, OK, then. And uh, I was stopped uh, in the street the other day and uh, a bloke said, I've got some half price sandwiches here. I bought one off him. And I got it home and opened it up and there's nothing in it. It was a scam sandwich. <laughs> there you go. You see, this is what you're not paying for. <laughs> Ring the bell. Uh, now, remember with these scams, cheats and all the rest of it, the reason they're doing it is because it's... Uh, they have to put the same amount of effort in to get your £3,000 or your £10,000 as they do to get your £200. So actually yeah. it's very profitable for these criminals because that is what they are to misrepresent uh, themselves and other businesses and to cheat customers. So uh, I suppose uh, that it's... What was it? Buyer beware. Is it caveat emptor? Uh, caveat emptor? I think That's it, it. it is, yeah. Yep. But... Uh, the, the, You've just really got to be on your guard. You've got to be wary. If if it's too good to be true, that, it is. that deal is probably a scam. Yeah, and if your gut says there's something not right here, trust it and just slow down. Just, you know, don't go launching into it. As this guy did, he was about literally about to send the money. I thought, hang on, I'm just going to contact this company uh, and just check this is real. And thankfully, he, he avoided losing £3,000. Yeah, because the bank won't pay you if you've voluntarily paid that £3,000 out to a crook. It was a backs payment that he was about to make, so yeah, no, yeah. He, he wouldn't have got it back. You're not going to get that back. No. So always be careful and it, trust your gut. Go and see it in person. He, For some reason, he hadn't gone to see to see this trailer, uh, but I would recommend, if you can, I know I didn't when I sent this chap £200, but our conversation was on the telephone, and he actually sent me a video of him walking around it, um, and you know he showed me something with the date on, so I could see it was it was genuine, and he was a genuine seller, and I wanted him to know I was a genuine buyer as well. So go in person and go and see it, or send someone else if you can't. You know, Try and get somebody else to go and inspect it. With a motorhome, I'd recommend, though, um, you know, aside of all the online scamming bit, is just check its habitation history. That's so important. If you can't go and see it, send an engineer to go and look at it. For £100 or £200, you could end up not losing £20,000. plus So I would definitely send an engineer to go and look at it. And if the, if the seller isn't genuine, they will say no. Yeah, they won't, be, they won't because they haven't got the, the, the they haven't got the thing they're advertising in the first place. They've just got a photograph of it, which they put right. up, haven't they? Yeah. So the whole thing is a cheat. So you're right. If you say I want to send somebody on to have a look and uh, do a check, they, of course they're going to say no because they're crooks. Yeah, that's right. So they'll you know they they just want an easy win. So they want people that can't come, won't come, and just want to give them money. Uh, don't be that victim. So send someone to go and do a hab check if you can't do it. If you if if you can't go and see it, you know, then then get someone else to go. Even if you can go and see it, I would still make sure it has a habitation check if you're buying it privately, or at the bare minimum, a damp check. This is so important. There are so many motorhomes at the moment for sale on eBay that are there because nobody else wants to buy them, uh, and they can't be sold anywhere else. They've either come out of an auction. I I can see several online at the moment as we were recording this. Uh, as, you know, this morning I was on eBay having a look and on Facebook Marketplace, and I know there are motorhomes there that have been through an auction and not sold because they are basically mobile goldfish bowls. They are rotten, uh, and that's why they're on eBay. So you know, not all of them are terrible, but some are. We must say this is not eBay or Facebook Marketplace's fault. They are open to anybody. You have got to check yourself. It's not up to them to make sure the person who says that they are selling it is completely uh, 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 above the law eBay has already asked them questions and has done some checks, as does Facebook. And to the best of their knowledge, these people are honest. But crooks are crooks and they're very sophisticated and they will find a way through. So no criticism of these auction sites. No, no it's not their fault, is it? They're just the, they're just the platform. Um, but definitely go and check habitation service history. Uh, if it doesn't have one, I'd be very cautious and I would definitely be getting a habitation check done. We've had people ask us about this before. And yes, it will slow down your purchase. 
um, but there could well be a, a dark reason why it hasn't had a habitation check presented to you um, or why it hasn't had a damp check recently. So yep. definitely, please go and get one of those done. And they'll come out with all the excuses. I've got to sell it quickly. My mother's dying or, you know, I've got to rush off here and do this. I need the money quickly. They, or we don't really have time. They will try anything to get their hands on your money. They will. So as Matt says, yeah, you dictate the pace the other thing to look at is the v5 so you know we're often taught aren't we wait look at the address on the v5 is that the address you're viewing the vehicle now a v5 is not proof of ownership the new v5 state this very clearly across the front of them we invest a lot of authority in this document i think it's a pointless document but it's one that that carries value particularly as it still exists the sooner it all goes online the better i think it'll be less open to fraud but um check the v5 is the address the same if it's not why not now we have motorhomes here on our hire fleet at motorhome holiday company that are registered to my home address now the reason we do that is if somebody drives down a bus lane or extends their stay in a car park and doesn't pay the fine goes straight to my house and i know it will get opened and looked at straight away uh, it won't disappear into a pile of post in the office and sit on someone else's desk for a week we can deal with it straight away. That's why we do it. So we change the address to my home deliberately, but it, we won't necessarily be looking at the motorhome at my house. Um, so we explain this to people and you know they accept it. And if they want to come to my house, they can come in and have a cup of tea. But check the V5. Does it exist? If a V5 isn't present, you are potentially in for a headache trying to get one. Uh, we took a load of motorhomes off a motorhome hire business a few years ago during lockdown that had gone bust and lots of them didn't have a V5. It took about six or seven months to fix that. It was a nightmare before the, the administrator could do anything with them. Um, and they also check the service history. If it, As I say, with a habitation check, that's one side. But the engine and chassis service history, if it doesn't have any evidence at all, raise a red flag why not you know has it ever been serviced it's hard to know you can go and check the mot history of a vehicle online uh, that's easy done just google check mot history type the number plate in and every mot test it's ever had is online um, and it will show you what it failed on as well and any advisories uh, so you can track the history of a vehicle through its mot history completely free um, and and just go on the gov website and do that um, <clears throat> Other people have asked us in the past, oh, it's, it's five years old, it's only got 5,000 miles, it must be a good buy. Yeah, but someone lived in it for five years. <laughs> so what's the interior condition like? If it's really, really tired, you need to think about the water pump, the boiler, all those appliances have been working really hard during that time. It's only done 5,000 miles. Actually, for me, that's a reason not to buy it, even if it's not been lived in. I would be very cautious about buying an extremely low mileage motorhome. We perceive that as really good. Not necessarily. Bear in mind, these vehicles are built as delivery vans. They're designed to do 40, 50 or more 1,000 miles a year with regular service intervals. They will do that. Being driven 1,000 miles a year is not good for them. The diesel particulate filter gets blocked. The EGR valve, exhaust gas release valve can seize up. There's lots of issues that can occur through it not being driven. And what sort of mileage actually should be people be looking at as a reasonable one when they're buying their motorhome? Yeah, I mean, as I say, it's a delivery van underneath. So, you know, if it's got 100,000 miles, well, that's a lot of miles for a motorhome, even a 20-year-old one. Um, so, you know, has it been serviced? There's a great example a friend of mine giving me. He's in the car sales game and he had two BMWs for sale, both a three series BMW. One had an immaculate service history and was rusty and pretty tired to look at. The other was immaculate, really shiny, beautiful interior and no service history at all. Both a similar age. Which one do you think he sold? Uh, the second one. Of course he did. No one was interested in the first one. He really struggled to sell it. Yet yeah, that's the one. That's, that's the better car. A thousand pounds and a trip to a body shop, all that body work could be fixed. And, and we overlook that and we fall foul to the shiny penny syndrome. You know, well, it looks fantastic. Oh, there's no service. Oh, it'd be all right. Will it? It might be. But just be super cautious. Always go for the one with history over the one that's really shiny and has none at all. And the buyer is saying he's trying to push you and saying, I've got five other people uh, looking, but you're first in the queue. I'll sell to you if we can do the deal this afternoon. Don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. No, no. I remember a dealer friend of mine, a motorhome dealer, offered someone a deal. And it was it, it was a significant deal that day. And the guy said, oh, I'm going to go home and think about it. 
He said, really? He came in the next day. He said, I'd like to do it. He said, well, that was yesterday. It's a new day today. It's, it's back to the old price today. He wouldn't budge. <laughs> I don't know if the guy bought it. <laughs> I wouldn't have done. <laughs> no, I don't know. The other thing I'd recommend is an HPI check. Uh, and this is really important. They're about £20 to do. Uh, and it will tell you whether a vehicle has ever been stolen, written off, whether it has outstanding finance on it. I'll come back to that. Uh, how many previous owners has it had? Uh, has it ever been scrapped? It will tell you about its MOT history as well. It will also tell you the date of the last change of keeper. So that can be useful to know, uh, because if it's only been owned for four months, why? Why have they owned it for such a short space of time and now they're selling it? And did you know that HPI uncover a dark history or hidden history in one in three vehicles they check? So some kind of red flag. Now that could just be it had a private number plate once upon a time. Mm. There's nothing to worry about there. Uh, but one in three flags something. One in three checks flags something. That's incredible. And you can find all that out for £20. hpicheck.co.uk, I think it is, yeah. Um, just Google HPI check. And it's it's a really, really cost-effective service. We HPI everything we sell um, as part of our account with AutoTrader, actually. And uh, we have a whole load of checks that we are able to carry out on a vehicle. And this is on the chassis side, obviously. not the, It won't check the habitation side, only the MOT history of a vehicle. So the, the service history is not captured anywhere online uh, unless it's a, a, you can access a manufacturer's service history. Um, <clears throat> we can access Adria service histories, for example. We're an Adria warranty partner in the business here uh, and service partner. So we can look at the service history and warranty claims on an Adria vehicle, as an Adria dealer can. Um, so it's definitely worth phoning a dealer of that motorhome manufacturer and asking them if they would check it for you. I'm sure they would. It might cost you a case of th something, you know, chocolate <laughs> or beer. Uh, but it's definitely worth asking a dealer if they would do that for you. I'm sure many would. It's the Motorhome Matt podcast brought to you with that leisureshop.com. And we're talking about the first time buyer pitfalls and being scammed, pushed into doing a deal you're not absolutely comfortable with, but it's too good to be true. And as we said earlier, it probably is. Mm. Uh, let's go back to uh, finance, uh, shall we? Uh, but before we do that, we did have an episode uh, about buying privately versus dealer didn't we yeah. so it's in our library of podcasts so perhaps you should listen to that one as well if you're in the market yeah we we spoke to two local dealers um jmt leisure who are up the road from us here in north somerset uh, and our friends at chelston uh down in somerset uh and both of the owners give us a view on on you know why they obviously they're biased to buying from a dealer they are a dealer uh, but why why they felt that buying from a dealer was a, a better route uh, and for some people it is it's not for everyone some people will buy privately and have a great experience i'm a fan if you've never done this before i would suggest you consider buying from a dealership yes you might pay a little bit more but in recent years private sellers are commanding the same money as a dealer, you've got all the recourse, of course, buying from a dealer. So I would definitely consider if you've never done this and you know nothing about motorhomes, going and, and relying on a dealer. Yes, there are some bad ones out there. Um, and you can find those by Googling them and searching up reviews. Uh, and I suggest you do that. But go and check out that whole episode. It's really useful. Oh, we've got another episode, haven't we? Uh, uh, the one on creative funding solutions. Yes, so we were talking about motorhome finance and how that works, and Steve from Creative uh, joined us on that. That's a really good episode if you want to understand how motorhome finance works, because it's different to car finance very slightly. Uh, it's more favourable, I'd say. But if you're buying a motorhome privately and it's got finance on it, then you shouldn't dismiss it. You need to know it's got finance on it because if you go giving the owner the £40,000 they're asking for and it's still got £28,000 of finance on it, the finance company own that vehicle and they can come and claim it from you and just they'll just take it off you. You've lost that money. You will not get that back. So the importance of an HPI check is so acute here. It will tell you that there's finance. Um, and then you can go and liaise directly with the finance company on paying that finance down and paying it off and then any balance giving to the seller. So in terms of dealing with a, a private seller that's got finance, that's perfectly reasonable. They would be able to request a settlement figure and then you could contact the finance company and pay them direct. 
Uh, it probably would take about a week, though, for that imprint on the vehicle that it's got finance on to disappear, but they will confirm that you've paid them within normally a few hours, maybe a few days, and then the balance you give to the seller. What's this about a hydrogen motorhome, Matt? <laughs> or not hydrogen motorhome, Matt, a hydrogen motorhome, <laughs> comma, Matt. So this story made me laugh. This was on outandaboutlive.co.uk. And they've posted a story that a hydrogen camper van concept has been introduced. Well, it's a drawing. <laughs> so there's a company called First Hydrogen. I'm just looking at it here on my phone. They're based between London and Vancouver, uh, and they're exploring uh, a hydrogen-powered van. And so they've drawn a very funky-looking camper van, uh, uh, which apparently is going to be hydrogen-powered. But it seems like we're sort of peaking a bit early with this story sounds like it i've done my own concept if you <laughs> is it possible to zoom in here's keith's concept here i've got a nightclub in the bottom floor of my concept motorhome and a block of flats <laughs> above so it's not very far to stagger home but yeah you know, it's a concept well it must be real then it must be true it's coming where can i buy one <laughs> yeah and mine is fueled with good wishes <laughs> And sausage rolls. And fairy dust. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt hydrogen's going to feature one day. Uh, what we'll see, as it feels like it's a lo even longer away than EVs at the moment, doesn't it? It does, and there's nowhere to pump your hydrogen either, is there? Is, is that what petrol stations are going to become, do you think? Maybe. E-fuels as well, synthetic fuel. Formula One are all over that. So, yeah, it's interesting topic we'll, we'll keep on exploring and unpacking this don't worry we've got some fantastic experts coming on the podcast you know a lot more about this than me uh, and and they really start to dispel a few myths there's a phrase called a fud do you know what a fud is no i do not know what a fud is is fud it, is it the sound that i make when i fall out of bed <laughs> it's a fear of unknown and doubt there oh, we are fud yeah and i think there's a lot of fud around this topic yes where change is being forced upon us and it's it's that fear of unknown and doubt is creating all these concerns and, and, and these, you know, pub conversations. Uh, so we're starting to unpack more and more on this whole topic of EV, so stay tuned. Yep, do. Now, we hope that we've cleared up some of the issues you might have if you're a first-time buyer, some of the pitfalls you might come across. Number one, uh, don't be scammed into making a quick decision and transferring your hard-earned into somebody else's account and finding out that you've not even got a drawing of Keith's concept car here uh, before uh, you find out that you have been scammed. Do your HPI check just £20. You can find out a whole lot about uh, that. It's a motorhome or caravan that you, you're going to be buying. Is it motorhome or caravan? Well, that's a good point, actually. On a caravan, you can contact the CRIS, so the Caravan Registration Service, C-R-I-S. And often a caravan, your note has the indelible ink in the windows, a whole load of numbers, and that's its CRIS number. And that's like a V5 for a caravan. It's an opt-in uh, service so not every caravan is part of the Chris scheme but Chris will tell you whether that caravan has ever been reported stolen written off and again there's an, a small fee I think it's about 20 pounds um, and you can contact Chris and give them the number that's etched in the window and they will um, they will tell you a bit more about the caravan yep okay then hope that's helped you let's do our audience questions and answers well, my favorite part of every podcast Colin Coulthard's in Harrow he says I'm looking at Wi-Fi for the motorhome and remembered you said you had a good deal you used at the NEC uh, that is the, the big shows in February and in October for motorhomes and uh, caravans and such like would this be any good on the road he asks it absolutely yeah we've been uh, we've been trialing a little 4g router from Falcon they're 195 quid we've got them in the shop at thatledgershop.com uh, and they're a little plastic box with two great big aerials on and you can they connect with a sim card we sell them with a sim as well there's a sim in the available to buy in the shop uh, and uh, if you're not sure what sim you need give us a call we're going to unpack that in a separate podcast uh, but they are brilliant on the road, Colin. Um, they have two little suckers, so you can stick them on the window uh, of your motorhome. They're powered by 240 volts, so a three-pin plug or a cigarette socket. So when you're driving, they'll work as well. We well, don't call them cigarette sockets anymore. That's Aren't they? not very PC. It's a 12-volt out outlet. <laughs> okay. It's a cigarette lighter, isn't no, it? No, 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 no. <laughs> so you can plug it in the dash or you can plug it in the back where the TV would plug in. Uh, we were using them at the NEC show. In fact, we're using them at all of the outdoor shows for our little credit card machines to connect to. And they're brilliant. They're really good. Uh, and... 
they're yeah i think they're a fantastic solution no drilling in the van or anything like that avtex of course make the aerial that goes on the roof as do falcon as do maxview there's lots of brands out there they need installing and we we have a whole episode on that as well don't we in the past on on motone wi-fi there's no installation at all literally plug it in stick it to the window ideally outside but it'll work inside as well uh, and we we've been sticking them up in the roof light of a motorhome whilst we're parked on a showground work a treat talking of the showgrounds uh, colin wants to know if you're going to the norfolk motorhome and caravan show in july he's going on the saturday brilliant we are we're there all weekend colin we'll see you there on the saturday come and say hi and we're very excited about going to norfolk because jude and i are heading off in the camper van straight after the show and going to tour around the coast lovely yeah if you're listening to this and you've done norfolk we want to go down to the sort of heading a bit south so east suffolk so if you've got some travel tips and campsite tips i'd love to have them because that's where we're going rebecca de lucas in nottingham hi matt do you know how the proposal to give everyone's grandfather rights is going last year the department of transport sent out for some industry feedback to gauge demand and feeling with their response due early 2023 i've ordered my first motorhome and need a c1 license in time for when it arrives do you think things are going to change this year making it unnecessary for me to have to go through the rigmarole of getting a c1 license and we've covered this a lot haven't we Matt so has anything changed not to our knowledge not yet not as we record this so we've been trying to find out I know the Department for Transport have created the proposal which has gone to Parliament or is going to Parliament we're still waiting for news Uh, it's it's an open jury really as to what will happen I personally hope and I believe that it will we will revert back to and for people who don't know what's behind this is so this is about i think about lowering the resistance to becoming a lorry driver so it means that anyone who's passed their test can now drive something up to seven and a half tons which is what you and i can do because we're old so if you pass your test before 1997 we could get out of our little learner mini and straight into a seven and a half ton truck arguably not the best step in terms of car ownership Uh, but then it was introduced it was an eu regulation in january the first 1997 you pass your test from today onwards you are capped at three and a half tons Uh, which uh, a four and a half ton vehicle is no different to drive (laughs) to a three and a half ton vehicle a seven and a half ton truck is a bit different but obviously. it means you have to take another test to, to, to get that added to your so license already the rule for towing has changed so that's made the uh route to, to driving something with a trailer uh much easier uh so i do think that this european directive of a c1 uh will uh, restriction will be lifted um, so hopefully in time for when your motem arrives otherwise you will be taking the test and it'll be sod's law they'll lift it the week after you pass there you go, Rebecca. I hope that helped. Alan Shrimpton has dropped us in a paper form at one of your shows uh, that you've been gallivanting on throughout the country. Is it legal to tow an A-trailer behind a motorhome in France and Spain? So I think what Alan's referring to is a car on a, on a tow frame, an A-frame it's often referred to, where the car is on the road. Is it legal? Yes, it's legal because it's legal in the UK, assuming that the car and the motorhome or the towing vehicle come from the UK. The car in the UK is considered a trailer. However, the, F- the F- Spanish and the French authorities don't like it. And the reason is because the car isn't effectively braked. So when you brake in a car, towing a, a trailer, you get something called overrun brakes. The trailer comes toward the back of the car. It's called inertia. And in doing so, it compresses something that pulls the brakes on, that makes the trailer brake itself as well. And then you stop braking and the trailer goes back and the brakes come off. A tow car doesn't do that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I passed one on the road uh, the other day. It was a big motorhome and they were towing a small car behind. And you, I thought when you were towing a car, you had to have somebody in the driver's seat. When you're towing a broken down car, that's what you have to do. Yeah. For, as you say, effective braking. So you, you don't have to do that in every case in a motorhome. Is no, so case? on an A-frame, it attaches to the front of the car. You leave the keys in the ignition so the steering lock isn't on and it just follows you like an obedient dog. It's amazing. The wheels turn. It just follows you. You don't have to have anyone in it. In fact, having someone in it is probably dangerous. But on the continent, they're considered a recovery device. So they are considered for that purpose only. And of course, in your motorhome, towing your car, you're obviously not recovering a car. It's your daily drive whilst you're on holiday. And they don't like it. So my advice is if you're going onto the continent, you take a trailer 
for the car, which is properly braked. Now, you can, and people will come back to us and say, ah, but I've got a brake buddy on my tow car, and that's a device that applies the brake pedal when you brake. There are electronic ones, there are inertia-driven ones, there's a whole range of them you can buy, different brands and so on. The reality is the brakes in a car only work effectively when the engine's running because they've got a servo assisting the brakes. When you're towing the car, the engine's off, so therefore the brakes aren't very effective. They're far less effective than a trailer with overrun brakes. So my advice is put the car on a trailer. The downside to that, been there and done this, is when you arrive on the campsite, you're then juggling three vehicles. You've got the motorhome, the trailer and the car. And remember, you need to take insurance documents and make sure you've got a UK sticker on the back of every vehicle. So all the paperwork... MOT V5 you need to hack that for every vehicle if you're going onto the continent. So is it legal to tow an A trailer behind a motorhome in France and Spain? Well that was the question. Legal yes but it doesn't matter what bit of paper you're waving at that French copper. If he wants you to take that car off the back of the motorhome you're taking the car off. Never argue with a man with a gun. (laughs) <laughs> That's, well, I, this happened to me. We were trying to go through the Mont Blanc tunnel and I was towing a car on an A-frame and they made us unhitch the car. And I said, why? And I refused. For quoi? Yeah, exactly. Well, lucky there were two of us in the motorhome. So we had to pay two tolls. And I'm convinced this is what it was all about. We had to pay the toll twice, drive through the Mont Blanc tunnel, got out the other side, hitched it back on, carried on. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and another thing, a momentum. Momentum, uh, as you were you were talking about it as well. You know those huge um, freight trains they have in America, about a mile long. Yeah. They spend the first fifteen minutes before they set off uh, reversing back the train. So every one of their box cars is pushed tightly up against the next one. So when they pull away, they only ever pulling the weight of the first box car oh, I see. and then the second. So the couplings, the, yeah. So the couplings move and it, and they get enough momentum to move the whole train. I wonder how long it takes to stop one of those. <laughs> well, they're a mile long, more than yeah. a mile. <laughs> well, I'll go back. To, I'll go back to the trailer that we've just bought for the shop um, online, and and yeah, that you can feel when you're towing that full of shop stock. Yeah, we tow that on the back of a motorhome and you can feel when you brake, you feel the trailer braking, but it definitely increases our braking time. Yeah. Okay, so that's us done and dusted for today. How should people get in touch then, Matt? Really easily. You can get in touch with us on Facebook or Instagram or even on TikTok. We're a big sensation on TikTok. (laughs) My kids are very impressed. You can find us at motorhomemat.co.uk as well. And whilst you're there, if you type forward slash ask matt you can record a question make a contribution you can record your voice or you can just enter it on the form and make sure you go and find us on youtube as well you'll find different content there too which you can indulge in and make sure you hit the bell hit subscribe and then the gods of youtube can tell you when a new episode is released 